Uh, first off, welcome to the eBeam suite at the Nanotech User Facility at the University of Washington. Uh, my name is Scott Braswell and I'm responsible for this instrument that you see here. This is a scanning electron microscope, uh, an FEI. Uh, the model is a Sirion uh, field emission uh, scanning electron microscope. So the basic science behind scanning electron microscopy is pretty simple. It's been around for more than 50 years. Uh, it's a way of beating the diffraction limit of light. So any item smaller than half the wavelength of light is too small uh, to see with a light microscope. Uh, electrons have a much shorter wavelength, so we're able to image uh, structures that are a lot smaller than the diffraction limit of light uh, in order to see what's going on at that scale, the nanoscale. The main parts of the microscope that you see here are the column, it's a cylindrical piece. Uh, the chamber is the square. Uh, at the bottom. Uh, the table that the system is mounted on and to your left here is the user console where you do all the microscope manipulations. So at the top of the column uh, in this section right here is an electron gun. Uh, as I mentioned this is a field emission scanning electron microscope. So the electron gun is assen essentially a, a tungsten filament, a very sharp filament um, we use a strong uh, electronic field to draw a, a current off of that filament and that creates the beam, uh, the probe beam that you use to impinge on the sample and image the sample. Uh, below the electron gun there are uh, condenser lenses, scanning coils for moving the beam, uh, stigmators for adjusting the roundness of the beam, and uh, ultimately there's a probe lens at the bottom, uh, down at the, about this level. When the probe, the electron beam exits from the probe lenses, it then enters the chamber which is the square section here and uh, it impacts the sample where the sample absorbs the energy of those electrons and then re-emits uh, new signals that we use to image the sample. In the table you'll see across the front are the main power switches for the system. The user doesn't need to adjust these power switches for any reason, they're only for maintenance purposes. You'll also find inside of the table there's a, a turbo pump that actually uh, helps pump the chamber down to high vacuum. Uh, the chamber pressure is on the order of 10 to the minus 5 millibar. Um, there are two different pumps uh, used to pump the chamber down to that level. Uh, the main pump is located in the adjacent closet that you don't see and then the turbo pump is in this table here. Also there is a um, pneumatic isolation system in this table uh, to dampen acoustic vibrations uh, so that you don't see any uh, small vibration in your sample while you're viewing it. Uh, if I push lightly on the column you'll see that it adjusts and uh, the column is floating and that's how we dampen out some of the acoustic vibrations of people walking into the room or people talking loudly or laughing um, so that those things don't show up in the image. To operate the microscope there are two pieces of software, both run from the same CPU. And you see both of these are open on uh, two different monitors over here on the left. Um, on the right hand monitor we have a program called Microscope Control which is used for all the adjustments on the microscope. And on the left hand monitor is a database called Scandium which we use to store the images uh, before we export them uh, for our own use. On the front of the chamber door here you see there are several knobs and a few handles. Um, this chamber door is held shut by the vacuum inside of the sample chamber. There's actually no latch on the door. So when you uh, vent the chamber to atmospheric pressure in order to load a sample, uh, the door will easily roll open when you pull on this handle. And we'll close it up and pump the air out in order to reestablish vacuum before we start imaging the sample. The knobs on the front of the door are adjustments for the stage. These are the manual adjustments. You can also adjust the stage through the software and we'll talk about that later. Uh, the, la the stage knobs are labeled Y, X, R for rotation and Z for height in the counterclockwise direction. Uh, so all of those aspects of the stage are motorized and you can control those through the software. Um, the one manual adjustment on the stage is the tilt. Uh, rotation is turning uh, laterally sort of this direction. Tilt, we can actually also tilt the sample up to 45 degrees. And that's a manual adjustment that's done with this handle and stage lock on the front of the door. The sample preparation happens uh, in this area here. Um, because we're putting a sample into a high vacuum environment, uh, 10 to the minus 5 millibar, uh, a lot of things that exist 
uh, in the normal environment as liquids or solids uh, or can be vaporized. So we want to keep the sample as clean as possible, which includes keeping our finger, finger oils off of it and also any condensation from the air. Uh, we store the samples in a desiccator box uh, to avoid a collection of water on those. And then we also glove up with uh, vinyl gloves to make sure that we don't uh, deposit any material on the sample that we're handling. So out of the desiccator box, I'm just going to take a few standard samples that I keep for training purposes. The inside of the chamber only has one position, uh, or room for one, one pin mount stub, one sample. Uh, so we use this four stub adapter in order to uh, expand the stage so that you can look at up to four small samples uh, in one sitting without having to vent the chamber to atmosphere and reload it. So each position on this four stub holder has a set screw in the side to secure the sample. It needs to be loosened first with an Allen key before you can remove the stub. And then the standard samples I have here for us today, we are going to look at um, standard gold nanoparticles on carbon and tin spheres. The gold nanoparticles on carbon give you very high contrast. Um, so they're good for looking at the resolution limit of the microscope. And you can see that I'm handling it with a pair of tweezers. Um, each sample has a small groove in the side. If we were to actually touch the surface of the sample, uh, we would cause a lot of damage to the thin film that's deposited there. So in order to avoid damaging the sample, handling with these tweezers uh, in the groove on the sample uh, holder is the best way to manipulate these. So I'm going to place the gold nanoparticles uh, on the top position. And then I'm also going to put a sample of tin spheres uh, to the right of it. When I mount the sample holder, I always try to put my samples in the same orientation so that once I've loaded it into the chamber and I'm imaging on the microscope, I can remember where everything is located relative to one another. Uh, it's a good idea to get in the habit of uh, placing things in the same position each time uh, so that you don't get lost. Because when samples are in the chamber and you only see a small area of view, uh, it can be a little bit disorienting. And it might take some time to find samples if you don't know where they're located. So we'll start with these two samples today. Um, they've both been kept dry in the desiccator. I've been gloved so I'm not depositing any material on them and the next thing I'm going to do before I insert them in the chamber is uh, just blow them lightly off with a stream of nitrogen gas to make sure that any dust that's settled on the surface is removed. So this is ultra high purity nitrogen gas and it's fitted with a, a gas gun. So what I'm going to do is use a stream of nitrogen from this gas gun to just remove any loose debris from the surface of the sample before we image it. 